Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Paul Tchaikovsky. I'm a cloud architect at uh, Blue Box, an IBM company. Oh. oh. Um, I'm Rachel. I am an engineer on the QA um, automation team. I'm Zachary Seiss. I uh, work on IBM Blue Box. So we're going to be talking about a few things. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why we're doing compliance and how we're doing compliance. Uh, we go through a little bit of history of where Bluebus came from, what we did before acquisition, and then what we've done through acquisition, and you know what we're kind of doing now and where we're going towards as far as compliance and how we're applying DevOps principles to it. So you know, OpenStack is kind of installing OpenStack is kind of a solved problem at this point. Um, there's plenty of tooling out there to do it. Uh, there's it's still pretty difficult because you've got to, like the architecture and deciding how you want it to work is still pretty tough. Uh, and then the, the day one operations is still uh, qu quite tough. There is a bunch of uh, DevOps tools um, that are out there for installing OpenStack. Uh, we, we use Ursula, which is uh, Blue Box wrote it. Uh, it is open source. And there's OpenStack, Ansible, there's Chef, Puppet, etc. Uh, and most of these will help you with like the, the day zero installation. Uh, and then they'll also do some amount of you know, ongoing operations, helping keeping things in a working state, et cetera. Uh, and then a couple of them, the two that are involved, actually also help with uh, compliance and security. Uh, if, you, if, you don't, if you're not currently subscribing to any sort of you know, base compliance for your OS, uh, I do highly recommend the STIG. Uh, they have for uh, most OSs that it's fairly rel specific, but a lot of it applies to Debian and Ubuntu as well. Uh, and they also have STIGs for a lot of applications and other stuff, as you've got the stack, MySQL, and stuff like that. Uh, and it's got a lot of good, really good defaults uh, to help you make sure that you're not really doing anything really dumb from a security perspective on your OS. Um, the relationship between Ops and security uh, is, can still be pretty contentious. You know, this is kind of how the security team sees themselves. Uh, you know, the DevOps are up here, you know, shitting out all this beautiful uh, unicorn poop, and they're trying to shovel it up and actually make sense out of it. And it's not that unusual to see like your automation tools from an operations perspective and your tooling from a um, compliance perspective actually fighting with each other over, you know, settings in, a, in an SSH config file or or whatever or you know. Ansible will go, will go and set it one way. Security team will go and like change it. Next time Ansible runs, it, it changes again, and that's that's not really cool. And so we're trying to bridge that and bring security into the sort of the DevOps model, and help give them ways to contribute to our automation, and provide us um, specifications in ways that we can more easily consume and more e easily test. Uh, and uh, yeah, as I said earlier, both Ursula and uh, OpenStack for Ansible, uh, Ansible for OpenStack, whichever way it is, uh, do uh, some stuff uh, towards compliance. Uh, OpenStack for Ansible does, is, is based on STIGs. Uh, the Blue Box stuff is kind of based around some of the uh, internal IBM uh, security, but we want to start looking at making it more like STIG so that we can hopefully open source a lot more of our compliance bits. Uh, and like if you if you're buy, if you're buying OpenStack from someone or getting an OpenStack distribution from someone, you really need to be making sure that they have some support for compliance stuff. Um, you know, even like getting to stuff like automatic password rotation and stuff like that. That's pretty important to a lot of enterprises. And uh, op OpenStack doesn't easily support that. You know, natively in a default install. And so it's important to make sure that uh, you're able to do that sort of stuff if you do care about compliance. Which if you're in here, you probably do. Um, and then, of course, e even if you have your OpenStack itself as compliant, you also need to make sure your workloads are compliant. You know, uh, just because your OpenStack is compliant to STIG doesn't mean the random WordPress sites or whatever whatever it is you run on cloud these days is uh, compliant. So make sure you do the same sort of compliance to your workloads. If you have to do disk encryption, there are ways to do disk encryption. Even if you don't want to go to you know all the way down to Barbican and low-level disk encryption there, you can still you know, encrypt LV LVMs of uh, Cinder volumes and stuff like that. 
Uh, so a little bit about Blue Box. Uh, we sort of we're I don't know a dozen or more years old. Uh, we started Blue Box Cloud as a project a couple of years ago, uh, and have had pretty good success with it. Uh, in June last year, we were acquired by uh, Big Blue, uh, which was uh, an interesting uh, process. Uh, but one of the things we got out of that acquisition was access to all of the soft layer data centers. And so we went from having kind of two data centers we could deploy into to having 30 plus data centers we could deploy into. Uh, and that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, but also, uh, as part of that, uh, a lot more interest in compliance and stuff came in, because uh, that's kind of one of IBM's big things, is security and compliance. And we, did, we were interested in that, um, but not quite as formally as IBM is. Uh, so we have, uh, we basically had perimeterless security. We, we always considered putting hosts uh, on the internet first. So most, most of our hosts always had a public IP. So we were very focused around firewalling at, at the OS, uh, a lot of IP tables rules and stuff like that. And then if a customer wanted something different, it was easy to add perimeters, um, firewalls, uh, stuff like that, than it was to take them away and be surprised by them. Um, and then we've always had security as part of our testing pipeline, like, you know, we're running the ELK stack, we always check that we've got port 9200 on Elasticsearch firewalled off from the public internet and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, but we never actually had like really good formal compliance and, and testing. So part of IB being acquired by IBM is called blue washing, and that, that brings in like doing uh, your open source uh, software license audits, making sure you're not bringing any GPL in and poisoning your code base, um, making sure that all the authors of the software you're writing are IBM employees or have uh, signed the appropriate licensing agreements, etc. Uh, a lot of code scanning, port scanning, uh, sort of going down the stack of uh, security and compliance. And that's kind of my bit. So now we'll talk a little bit about uh, tech specs. Um, but before we get into that, uh, so I, I was with IBM uh, pre-Blue Box. Uh, so I've seen plenty of changes uh, over the past year and a half or so. Uh, I try not to break things, because if I do, Paul gets very mad at me. So I'm um, going to try not to break this presentation. Uh, so what is a tech spec? Uh, so before Blue Box, uh, you know, the tech specs were a way of ensuring generic config settings as well as uh, compliance settings for security folks. Um, they were <laughs> Excel spreadsheets in a shared storage space. And feast your eyes on the glory that is a tech spec. Uh, so I had to uh, compile these when Blue Box was acquired. And uh, that was very fun. Uh, so here's a small example. Uh, this one. So it sets the uh, no anonymous user access within MySQL database. Uh, you can see the initial value uh, would have to go in by hand and run those on every single machine that we had. Uh, so yeah, it was uh, interesting times. Uh, of course, tech specs were run by hand, so all the man hours wasted. Um, they're usually written by rote, so you know, with little understanding of the why and the how. Uh, they'd also cause conflicts with running our software, um, just because, you know, stupid little checks. And last but not least, the commands were in Excel spreadsheets. Uh, so yeah, so after Blue Box uh, was acquired, the tech specs uh, ca came down a little more. Uh, so they were limited to just compliance and best practice settings, uh, written in YAML, stored in GitHub, so, you know, so easy a caveman could do them. Uh, we use server spec, uh, which are just our spec uh, tests to run our tech specs, which then report back to Sensu. And PagerDuty alerts us if anyone changes anything they're not supposed to. So yeah, needless to say, things got uh, a little better when, when Blue Box joined. Uh, so a couple of the rules. Uh, YAML-based documents, uh, they needed to have a specific ID code um, remove the complexity behind, you know, compliance and the best practice guidelines, as well as, you know, just make sh making sure that they're easily readable and understandable. A couple more rules. Uh, so they should be linked to at least one Ansible task or a server spec test. Uh, they shouldn't be generic config settings, so none of that, 
you know, making sure a user exists. Uh, they should describe the expected outcome and the reason behind it, so actually you know, understanding what you're doing and why you're doing it. Uh, and they should have a link back to the original compliance document. So here's a, a good example, uh, written in YAML. It has the unique ID code OPS001 and uh, has the good description uh, explaining what, like why, we're, why we're writing this one. Here's a bad example. So this one uh, is, looks just like a basic generic config setting. Uh, it doesn't explain why the setting is important in the first place. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> these were all written up in our new uh, tech spec uh, checks. So we just you know, went and did the same thing that we usually do and wrote it again. Uh, so here's what it looks like in, uh, in Ansible. Uh, so you can see that these are a couple of server spec checks. Uh, GFN 12, just stating that it should be a file, and GFN 13 is stating that the password should be 16 characters long. But does anyone see what's wrong with that? It's just checking for a word. It's not the best of password checkers. Uh, so here's an example of what it looks like in server spec, uh, in Sensu, sorry. Uh, so I'm sure you all are familiar with Uchiwa dashboard. Um, as you can see, I did not fix this one, so I have to fix this after the presentation. Uh, here's what it looks like in our uh, Kibana uh, dashboard. So Sensu client logs every failure to Elk, uh, and so we'll have that audit trail of every pass, every fail um, for every hour. And uh, Elasticsearch is backed up to our object storage, so maintaining our uh, long-term audit requirements, something like 270 days. Uh, and some future work, uh, we're gonna move away from server spec and move on to inspec. Uh, so it's essentially, you know, like server spec, it's based on RSpec, um, but it's much richer compliance uh, DSL, uh, richer focused compliance on DSL. Uh, so it increases our DevOps culture to include security and compliance folks, uh, allowing them to do test-driven development. Here's one example. Uh, so much like our tech spec rules, we have the uh, unique ID code. It has plenty of metadata, so required by uh, security and compliance. And uh, the description you know, explains the need for this check, so it's just SSH protocol. And a couple URLs, uh, so Chef Inspec and uh, Paul has graciously provided the Rails 6, uh, six stigs, uh, but he's working on more to come, so get ready for that. And Rachel. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what kind of testing goes on in the development and testing phases. So this is a really blurry cartoon. I'm sorry, I couldn't find a better one. But um, we can all relate to it, right? Like catch a bug, see a bug, fix it, resolve it, and then we're just going to see a bunch more. Like that's just part of life. Um, and so during development or testing stages, um, we're just constantly deploying our environments um, with the latest packages, testing upgrades, deploying with or without certain functionalities in order to find any kind of bugs and address them as soon as possible. So with every deployment, we need to make sure new changes don't break anything. And regression tests are run to verify this. Um, they're made up of Tempest and extra end-to-end -end test cases that we've created for Blue Box Cloud. Um, after that, we run smoke tests to figure out if the cloud is functional. Um, are the basic functions of the components working? Um, if not, then the pipeline is paused to verify the build or the environment. And then finally, we do performance testing. Can it perform up to standards? Is it doing what we expect it to do? And Jenkins helps us automate all these test buckets um, and lets us know when it's passed or failed. And we run this, slot, or this pipeline continuously through every deployment. So now that we have a product and development stages is over, we're ready for production, and it's um, time for a new set of testing. And before we get into testing tools, um, there's ITCS 104, which is 
um, IBM's own security policy standard. And it's very important to IBM that we use it because it provides a consistency and security for all of IBM's product line. And <clears throat> sorry, uh, for this process, I use ITCS policy for Nessus and AppScan. So Nessus is used to scan for infrastructure vulnerabilities. Um, it focus on, focuses on the network and supporting services. It also scans for vulnerabilities during port scans. And it, I like it because it has a simple GUI that we can import our profile into, our ITCS 104 profile into, and it can interpret that, and, that profile and scan for the infrastructure based on its requirements. So here's an example of Nessus um, would look like, like for results. Um, you can see that it ranks the vulnerabilities by severity, and it, you can also see, so there's a history tab right there. Um, you can also see the history of these scans um, and kind of compare your results. And you can also export it and give it to someone, maybe like a security expert or something. And so if we go more in depth into these vulnerabilities, Nessus also provides us um, a description um, and a solution. So right here we have SSL certificate cannot be trusted. Uh, it's description in depth and then a solution to the issue. Um, AppScan is a different type of scanner. Um, it scans UI and API and it looks for common vulnerabilities like the OWASP top 10 and web applications. And another cool thing that it, it's able to do, it's able to record and remember login credentials. Um, so it's kind of automated like that. Um, and when, it, when you want to scan an API, you kind of have to uh, set, you have to use it as a reverse proxy. Um, and what it'll do is the test runner will um, request, or send some requests. It'll go through AppScan, which is a, re uh, a reverse proxy. It'll record those requests, and then it'll test those requests. Um, but the thing with this is that it's only limited to Windows machines, and it's not a perfect scanner. Like, you're going to find false positives. So here are some examples of results that you'll see. So you have your security issues that are arranged by severity, as well as advisory um, for each issue, and then fixed recommendations. How are you going to fix it? Right. And so me and AppScan really don't have a great relationship. Like, we run into a lot of problems. And the next couple of slides are going to be the kind of problems that I ran into. So especially when scanning OpenStack APIs, um, we kind of had this problem because AppScan is only on Windows. Um, so we kind of first, we were like, OK, let's try and set up Tempest on a Windows machine. And I did it, but it was weird because I had to disable some things, and it just didn't feel right. Um, so the next thing that we did, our next approach, was we kind of put Tempest on its own separate Linux box and then used PuTTY to create an SSH tunnel from our Windows machine to our Linux machine and continued to use AppScan as a reverse proxy. So you go Tempest, SSH tunnel, reverse proxy, and then to your cloud, and that's just... That's a, lot of, that's a lot of connections that, you know, it didn't feel, it still didn't feel right. Like, it felt kind of, like, not right. So we had, so, okay, let me go back. This worked for one quarter. It didn't work for the next quarter. And then we had, we were, we had a deadline, so we had to kind of figure out, like, what is an alternative? And that alternative is Centrobos. And it's really easy to use, like much easier to use than with the risk proxy and the SSH tunnel. And it's specifically for OpenStack API security testing. And it um, aims to detect common security defects like SQL injection, LDAP injection, buffer flow, et cetera. And it fuzzes everything. Um, and it's a new project. Um, and hopefully, we're going to get feedback in the future. I actually have some that I've been postponing. But, um, and then also, we want to add additional test cases to kind of match our ITCS 104 profile. So this is what it looks like to test on one template. It's called policy endpoint get. Um, just this really simple one. It'll show you how many errors, how many failures, your progress, 
It'll also, it also shows you what it's testing, so buffer overflow, command injection, integer overflow, LDAP injection, SQL injection, et cetera, et cetera. And you can also pipe the results, and it'll show you the errors and the failures. So in this example, we have the failures, um, defect type 500. I think it's really cool because it'll tell you its confidence in it, so it has a high confidence that this is actually like real. And then um, the severity, like it's low severity, so whatever, um, but not really whatever. And then stats, an overall stat, so you have one low vulnerability. And that's the end. Oh, does anybody have any questions? All right. Thank you, everyone.